and they walk up their walk. Unfortunately, it is the area that, that is typically thin. It's the area that is subjected to a lot of heat and drought stress. If you're going to get weeds, that's typically where it's going to be. And in 2006, the community had a tremendous number of complaints about crabgrass along the edges, complained to Seascape, our hands were tied, there was nothing we could do. They, therefore, this year, they partitioned, if you will, the Coastal Resource Council to allow us to use one single application of the post-emergent crabgrass control and, and CRMC agreed to it. A few other provisions, okay, any, uh, we, we're required to leave a 10-foot buffer around any low-lying or wetland areas, um, completely at our discretion, there's no real definition of where those are, but it's at the applicator's dis uh, discretion to determine where those areas are and to leave the buffer. Uh, we are required to remove all product from paved and hard services. In our particular case, we do use deflectors, which greatly reduces the amount ending up on paved and hard services. This was something for, this was something that was quite easy for Seascape because we have for years been doing this anyways. We are required to, to do some, some homeowner education and we indeed give people information on mowing, whether it be height or clipping removal, information in regards to watering and perhaps the most difficult is information in regards to what to expect because we did tell people that your lawn is not going to look as good as, as perhaps you would like it to. You're perhaps going to have more weeds and crabgrass than you would like. Uh, however, if you mow properly and, and water properly, uh, we can overcome uh, a lot of those types of issues. This is a, a picture, obviously, we've been having a lot of rain, it, that, that the lawns don't always look this good in the community. Uh, but this was a picture that was taken in, in September of 2006. It was a year where we had a lot of rain. And this picture is very, very representative of the type of lawn quality that, that uh, we had developed under this program uh, over the last four years. I will have to tell you that lawn quality varies considerably within the neighborhood as you go from lawn to lawn. Uh, it's very obvious as we go through the community making applications and helping people with their lawns that not everybody returns clippings. A lot of people insist that they pick up clippings for whatever reason, and, it's a, and, and as much as the lawn care industry in general has been trying to convince the, the homeowners to, to not pick up clippings, for the last 15 to 20 years, the message is not getting out there. So we could see significant differences in lawn quality based upon clipping removal, certainly based upon, upon mowing height, Okay, uh, we could see differences with one species versus the other. The, the bluegrass lawns, for the most part, look better than the fescue lawns. And I can't help but think in looking at the, some of these lawns in this particular community, some homeowners were cheating and putting down some of their, fertilizer, their own fertilizer. I just look at some of these lawns and the way they, they, they appeared to me after looking at lawns for 40 years, you didn't get that on three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. So there was some cheating uh, going on. In terms of weeds, okay, which I think any of us in the lawn care business would agree to you, weeds are perhaps the one single biggest thing, thing that we get the most complaints about and the one single thing that perhaps if we do nothing else right, we've got to take care of weeds. Most of the weeds that we had in the area were in those non-thriving lawn areas, such as along curbs, okay. Mowing height had a big impact, as you would imagine. Several homeowners were not happy with the weed situations, and of course, I'm the one that got the phone calls and had to tell people, sorry, there's nothing more than we can do. Fortunately, uh, surface insects have not been a problem. We, and, and surface insects or grubs have not been a problem. Uh, for whatever reason, surface insects such as chinch bugs and bill bugs in New England have not been a big issue for the last several years. And for the most part, um, in this neighborhood, we have been able to avoid applications of surface insect and cure the grub altogether. In terms of education, uh, we initially started off trying to give everybody a, a, a slip once a year on, on a, a educational form once a year on mowing height and clippings and what their expectation should, should be. We've now realized that giving them that information once a year just isn't enough, and we've started to give them information on those kinds of things every single time we make an application. 
just an example of, of, of the types of edges. It's a combination of there's no topsoil here. Uh, parked cars end up in these kind of areas. The soil is compact, probably had very little topsoil to begin with. Just an impossible situation in order to, in order to grow grass. An area that did have a lot of dandelions this spring, but if you look at it closely, it's what I would call an area that is just not thriving for whatever reason. My guess is, uh, my guess is this is an area where the topsoil was, was cut away. There's very little soil here. There is considerable competition from, from roots in this area. This lawn has been getting, you can see how thin it is, it's been getting fertilizer, it's been getting nitrogen for, for now for four years. The lawn isn't thriving and the weeds were allowed to come in. A soil test now is probably in order. Some of the things that, that we are discussing, and I know CLMC and the University of Rhode Island is discussing, not only in regards to what's going on in Shady Lee Woods with what Seascape is doing, but in regards to what perhaps should be done in other areas as well. Uh, removing or limiting the amount of phosphorus in the lawn uh, or in the lawn programs. However, as previous speakers have said, there's not a lot of fertilizer, not a lot of phosphorus going down in most lawn fertilizers today. In fact, if you went through my warehouse, you'd see that many of my fertilizers contain zero phosphorus, and that's not something I've necessarily asked for. Many of the manufacturers are just now starting to do that on their own. Certainly, we need to, we need to uh, integrate into this program a soil testing program. Uh, we need to begin to do a better job correcting some of the underlying problems in those types of areas where we've got weed issues. Because we know with the, with the amount of nitrogen that we're applying, if it's mown properly, if it's watered properly, if clippings are returned, we don't have a huge amount of, of weeds in those areas. Some of the other things that we have considered uh, in terms of reducing further back the amount of pest control that, we have to, that, that we're going to be applying, we've talked in generalities about perhaps limiting um, uh, crabgrass control to just the front yards. If we go for a period of time without crabgrass, maybe we can skip the backyard. Maybe we can alternate years. Maybe we can put crabgrass control down one year, and if there is no crabgrass or an acceptable level of crabgrass, perhaps put it down uh, alternate years thereafter. Perhaps it would make, this make sense to apply materials just to the edges. Crabgrass control, for example. 90% of the crabgrass in this particular community, especially on people who mowed properly, 90% of the crabgrass is along edges. Maybe we should be applying crabgrass pre-emergent control along the edges only. And we've talked also about doing some things on sun versus shaded lawns. Many of these lawns have sunny front lot yards, shady backyards. Is it necessarily imperative that we put crabgrass control down in the shade? Is it imperative that we put grub control down in the shade? Generally, in those kinds of situations, you're not going to have a problem with crabgrass or, or with, with grubs. Um, just wanted to get a plug in just real quickly for commercial uh, applicators versus homeowner applications. Uh, you know, in, in terms of reducing potential for runoff, uh, I'm going to suggest that commercial applicators can perhaps easier than homeowners, and then I'm going to I'll throw a caveat out here in a moment. I think perhaps it's going to be easier to convince and to train commercial applicators if we want to start to do such things such as varying nitrogen rates depending upon the species or the season or the soil type or the weather. Getting that message out to homeowners, I think, is, is going to be difficult. You know, try to educate a homeowner as to whether or not they've got a bluegrass versus a fescue lawn Okay, and then take it the next step and say, well, now you're going to put less fertilizer on the fescue lawn than you're going to put on the bluegrass lawn. I think that's going to be impossible, an impossible message, but I also think that it's something perhaps we could get to commercial applicators before we can get to homeowners. Certainly commercial applicators have, I believe, a reduced potential to use more than is needed. It is absolutely an economic issue for us. Uh, it costs us a lot of money to put down extra fertilizer and extra pesticides, and there's no economic reason for us to do it. Commercial applicators are already using deflectors. Uh, clean up. There should perhaps be more of an education effort to go to commercial applicators. Again, they're not all the seascapes and they're not all the trublings of the world to clean up any material that ends up on, on 
on uh, hard surfaces. Uh, commercial applicators might be a 